Lord God Father, with all our getting to get understanding that we are changing the inside of us. Beyond the storm, beyond the trial. Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to our sit-ups, our spiritual impact training using prayer and scripture. Listen, I'm Tony Brooke Brown coming with our word for our spiritual nourishment today so we can be fed this word of God, apply it to our life. This is all about us getting spiritually fit so we're growing, we're changing, we're progressing. We're being impacted by the word so we can impact the world. Why? Because first, uh, Timothy Chapter 4, verses 7 and 8 is what we meditate on because we are exercising godliness. Why? Because it's profitable in this life and in the life to come. Because God tells us to be holy because he's holy. Because we're not only supposed to be hearers of this word, but doers. We're supposed to meditate on it day and night. We're supposed to pray without ceasing. So we pray and get the word. We get the word and we pray so we can be spiritually fit. We can be conformed into the image of his son. Be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Be who God purposed us to be. Walk in power and authority, standing against the wiles of the devil because we are being strengthened in the word, led by the spirit, walking in God's anointed. Listen, we are rejoicing today. I pray that you have joined us for our morning prayer today, Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's part of the sit-ups, part of the spiritual fitness. So if you've not yet joined us, please check out the information underneath this YouTube video as well as hitting like. And subscribe if you have it. Click the subscribe button. And then a bell will be there. If you hit the bell, you'll be notified when I upload videos. So let's move forward. We're in the book of Exodus. We're in chapter 8. We have to have pens and papers and highlighters and Bibles because you want to take notes. You want to write down the verses of scripture. You want to go back and study after we're done. You want to meditate on this word and get it. Get everything God has for you. And the Bible says with all you're getting get understanding. So get your Bibles, get your pen, paper, highlighter, get it together, get right, get focused, open your ears so you have ears to hear. And in the name of Jesus, Father, we come right now. We bless your name. We honor you. We glorify you. We worship you, God. We thank you that you are the great I am. We come hungry and thirsty for the word of God. We come today asking that your Holy Spirit will be our teacher and speak to us individually and collectively, giving us this spiritual nourishment that we are spiritually filled, that we are walking in power and authority, that we are walking in purpose, that we're bringing glory to your name, that we are effective as witnesses, that we are standing, Lord God, on your word, that we are going forth, spreading the gospel on fire, Lord God, for the things, Lord God, that pertain to the kingdom. So, Father, here we are. Have your way. Pour into us that we can pour into others. We give you all praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Exodus chapter 8. If you've been missing the studies, please go back to my channel. Find those other lessons. Meditate on them. Watch them. Listen to them. Get them on the inside. On, in the name of Jesus, we are in chapter 8. We are talking about Moses and Aaron confronting Pharaoh according to God's instructions. Um, telling Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go and worship God. Right? And doing it with signs and wonders because God is bringing judgment upon Egypt. So he's bringing plagues upon them. And we talked in the last session about the first plague, right? The first plague was when God had, um, the, you know, uh, turned the water into blood all throughout Egypt. Right. But now we're on the second plague. And remember, I told you on the last session that I'm not going to study on it. But if you want to, you can easily find some information and see if it feels right in your spirit, because I can't teach anything that's not in the word. But I was saying that oftentimes it is taught that um, each of these plagues, these uh, that that God was also coming against some of the false gods of Egypt because they did worship false gods. Um, and so, um, but we do know that he was presenting judgment upon them through these plagues. He was hardening Pharaoh's heart, oftentimes making him say no to letting the children of Israel go. Why? Because he said he was going to let them know he was God. He was revealing himself to the people of Egypt while he was placing judgment upon them, while he was letting them know that he is the one and only true God. There is none other. And so um, each time uh, that, that Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh, you know, God is in the midst. So we know that when they turn the water into blood, that the magicians that um, Pharaoh had imitated it. 
they were able to turn some water into blood as well. But God had turned all the water into blood throughout all of Egypt in the cups and the bowls and everything else. And it lasted for seven days. Now we are going to chapter eight and we are beginning in verse one. And today I'm going to read from the New Living Translation because I know reading these verses we're going through today, it won't lose its message. It's just going to be plain English, but you always go back. You always go back and you study the King James as well. So you write down these verses that we're going over today and we are beginning in verse 1 and it reads then the Lord said to Moses go back to Pharaoh and announce to him this is what the Lord says let my people go so they can worship me if you refuse to let them go I will send a plague of frogs across your entire land the Nile River will swarm with frogs they will come up out of the river and into your palace even into your bedroom and onto your bed they will enter the houses of your officials and your people they will even jump into your ovens and on your kneading bowls frogs will jump on you your people and all your officials so now this is the second plague that God is pronouncing over them he's saying if you don't let them go and God already told Moses that he wasn't gonna let them go right he said when he was done, after he stretched out his hand, eventually Pharaoh was going to let them go. But it wasn't time for it yet because he was revealing himself and his power to the people of Egypt. And uh, this will have an effect on the children of Israel as well. So now he's saying, if you don't let them go, I'm going to send this swarm of frogs. They're going to take up everybody's house everywhere. They're going to come up out of the water. They're going to come from everywhere in everywhere. They're going to jump in your ovens, on your kneading bowl. You're not even going to be able to cook. You're not going to be able to do nothing. They're going to be jumping on you. And then in verse 5, it says, remember, we're reading from the New Living Translation. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, raise the staff in your hand over all the rivers, canals, and ponds of Egypt and bring up frogs over all the land. So Aaron raised his hand over the waters of Egypt and frogs came up and, and covered the whole land. But the magicians were able to do the same thing with their magic. They too caused frogs to come up on the land of Egypt. Now, let's be clear. God is the one and only true God. Let's be clear that man has always tried to imitate. The devil is always trying to imitate. So even now, you know, you have them trying to clone, you know, trying to, you know, they, man is trying to do everything. They think man thinks he's so smart and so wise and comes up with ideas and thoughts trying to duplicate things that only God can do. People use drugs and drink it because they're trying to get peace, but peace comes from God. People are cloning, you know, uh, trying to clone people, trying to do stuff, trying to create life. People are coming up with all types of things, but at the end of the day, we better be careful because God says he's the one and only true God. And God is not pleased at some of the things that people are doing. People are trying to manipulate weather, trying to manipulate, you know, people trying to create things that only God can do, trying to duplicate things that God created. And we have to be very careful because people are crossing the line to the point where people think that they are God and they're worshiping others and worshiping themselves and talking about what they can do and eliminating God from the picture. Because when you see here that the magicians, yes, they did. They imitated this, but as we go on in the other plagues, we'll see they won't be able to do that. But in addition to that, notice something here. The magicians were able to cause frogs to come up, but in the end, at the end of the day, there's frogs everywhere. Why would you want some more frogs? But listen, in verse 8 it says, Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and begged, Plead with the Lord. He's, all, he's calling them the Lord. Now, remember when Moses went to him the first time, he's like, who is the Lord? And who is he that I should, you know, listen to him and obey him? I just think that the children of Israel, the Hebrews, they're just lazy. We're going to give them more work to do. But now all of a sudden, right, God is the Lord. All of a sudden, even though his magicians were able to duplicate um, making frogs come up, first of all, who wants more frogs? But at the end of the day, they can't get rid of the frogs. See, the thing is, is that man tries to duplicate the Lord. The devil tries to duplicate the works of the Lord. But at the end of the day, people and the devil will never be able to do what God is doing. Yeah, he got some magicians that can make a frog come up. 
but you can't put them back. You can't get rid of the frogs. You need some a solution, not somebody who's trying to create more of what you're trying to get rid of. So the thing is, is that here it says that Pharaoh summoned, he called for Moses and Aaron and begged them, plead, entreat your Lord, plead with them to take the frogs away from me and my people. I will let your people go so they can offer sacrifices to the Lord. He's saying, please, entreat, stand in the gap, intercede for us. Pray that your God, your Lord, pray that he will remove these frogs from me and my people. He's saying in the King James, entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people. And I'll let the people go that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. So notice when he says, even I wanted to go to the King James because I want you to know. That in the King James 2, he doesn't say your Lord, right? He doesn't say your God. He says entreat the Lord. He's acknowledging that he is the Lord. Not just, you know, go talk to your God or go talk to your Lord. He's saying entreat the Lord. Stand in the gap for us. Because his magicians couldn't get rid of the frogs. They couldn't solve the problem. They couldn't make things better. But remember this. This is what is really a hang up. For many, even in the body of Christ, be very careful because this is what happens when he asks Moses and Aaron to pray. In verse 9, it says, you set the time, Moses replied, tell me when you want me to pray for you, your officials and your people, then you and your houses will be rid of the frogs. They will remain only in the Nile River. Pharaoh says to him in verse 10, do it tomorrow. All right, Moses replied, it will be as you have said. Then you will know what? That there is no one like the Lord our God. All of this is so that they will know who God is. So he's saying, be it according to thy word, Moses says in the King James, that thou mayest know that there is none like unto the Lord our God. You're going to know because you're telling me what day to do it. And I'm telling you the way it's going to happen. It ain't going to be no frogs except in the Nile River. And so he tells them, uh, Pharaoh tells them when to do it. Moses said, okay, I'll do it when you said it. And this is what's going to happen, right? Verse 12, so Moses and Aaron left Pharaoh's palace and Moses cried out to the Lord about the frogs he had inflicted on Pharaoh. And the Lord did just what Moses had predicted. The frogs in the houses, the courtyards, and in the fields all died. The Egyptians piled them into great heaps and a terrible stench filled the land. But when Pharaoh saw that the relief had come, he became stubborn. He refused to listen to Moses and Aaron just as the Lord had predicted. So now he has Moses and Aaron pray. Moses tells him, hey, tell me when I'll do it and this is what's going to happen. So that's what happened. They went like Pharaoh told them. They prayed. They pleaded with God. God took the frogs away, right? But just as God had said, just as God had told them, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He wasn't going to let the people go. He wasn't hearkening to them. This is a problem that many need to examine themselves on. And when we look at principles and how to apply the word of God and see the mistakes that we see with the, with the people in the Bible that we can learn from, that we can grow from, that we can change from, how we can progress and draw nearer to God is we have to be very careful. There are things that we, we plead with God for. We ask other people, intercede, pray with me, come in agreement with me. That this will happen, that will happen. This will happen for my family member, for my loved one, for me, right? And then as soon as God does it, as soon as the prayer is answered, as soon as the need is met, as soon as the healing manifests, as soon as that person is delivered, people forget God. And they're still walking in disobedience, still turning away from God, still walking in rebellion. Be very careful. There are those, I'll use an example, somebody can have an illness. And they know that it came from smoking cigarettes, drinking or drugging, or they know that, you know, something happened because of a sin, because of something that they were doing to defile their body. Or maybe um, they were spending their money on things that they shouldn't and they, they, they obtained a debt that, that um, was avoidable, right? Pray for God, deliver, you know, supply this need. Heal my organs, heal my lungs, my, my kidneys, my liver. You know, make me whole. I know you're the healer. I know that you're the provider. And praying and pleading and begging with God and have other people praying and pleading and begging with God 
speaking God's word, confessing the truth, coming together in faith, standing on the word, on your face, on your knees, crying out. And then God hears you. He heals you. He supplies the need. He heals your family member or your loved one or he opens that door, right? If you just do it for me, God, if you just do this, I'll never do this again. If you just do this, I'm going to do that because that's what Pharaoh said. I'm going to let the people go. And we, and we make bargains and, and, and vows to God. If you just do this, you know, somebody, you know, thinks they're pregnant because they're, and they're in an ungodly relationship and they're fornicating, committing adultery, you know, oh God, if I, if you make it so I'm not pregnant, so, you know, so I don't have this disease or whatever it is, right? And God makes it so, you know, cause you're like, I'll never do this again. I, I'm never going to drink again. If you just take this away, I'm not going to waste my money again. If you just give me this job, I'm not going to be lazy and slothful anymore, you know, and God answers. But as soon as the prayer is answered, as soon as the need is met, as soon as the miracle happens, as soon as it suddenly comes to pass, people tend to go back to their old ways, to their old habits, to their own things, taking God for granted. That's a hardened heart. You know, oftentimes we think about a hardened heart and we think it ain't us. We think, well, that's somebody stubborn who's rebelling against God on purpose and that and this. But it's the same thing. That's exactly what people are doing. When they make a vow with God, a promise to God, if God does this and pleading with God and have other people pleading on their behalf and making bargains and vows and agreements with God, if you do this, people that get caught in a crime, Lord, if you just make it so I don't have to go to prison, if you just make it so that my sentence is light, people are always asking me, pray for my loved one. They got a court date, make it so that they have favor. But what did they do? And if they just get off, are they going to be better? Are they going to be changed? Do you care or you just don't want them to go to jail? You just don't want them to pay for what they've done. Are you praying for them to be changed, to be different, to be delivered, to give their life to God, to turn away from the wickedness and evil? Or you just don't want them locked up? You just don't want the consequences to take place. That's what's happening here. Pharaoh doesn't want the consequences, so he says, do this for me. And then I'm going to let the people go. But he doesn't. This is a rebellious heart. This is a stubborn heart. This is a hardened heart. And many people in the body of Christ have that. And it's dangerous. Because the Bible tells you don't make a vow with God and not keep it. It's foolish. And so this is what we want to focus on today though. Is that God is the one and only true God. I don't care Who's trying to imitate him? I don't care what man tries to do. I don't care who tries to be God. Who tries to, you know, to, to, to do that miracle healing. Who tries to supply that need. I don't care who tries to, you know, control the weather or control the people or control, you know, uh, things that are going on in the world. Tries to duplicate what God is doing. Trying to clone and trying to, you know, uh, just trying to be God. Let's be clear. Something that will change some people's life, that will change the focus, that will help us to become more godly and more holy and more surrendered and more uh, 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 yielded to God. We have to. You know, we think we know it. But in every situation, remember this. There is only one God. I don't care. Just like these magicians duplicated what God did, they couldn't remove the frogs. We can never fully duplicate. God may allow us to do some things, come up with some ideas, try some stuff out. But guess what? At the end of the day, people are never going to be God. The devil is never going to be God. The world is never going to be able to do what God is doing. There's some things that people know how to do right now. Some scientists, some workers, they know how to create a storm or do some stuff, but they ain't going to know how to turn some other stuff around. They're creating other havoc while they're trying to do what God does. And then when we create other stuff, then we don't know how to stop it. We don't know how to put an end to it. We don't know how to fix it. And so now, let's look at some verses of scripture for you to write down and go back and look at. First of all, I want us to look at the fact that in, um, we read in Exodus chapter 8, um, verse 10. Um, well, in verse nine, when Moses said to Pharaoh, I'm sorry, hold on one second. Let me make sure I'm in the right place here. Okay. So in verse nine, when Moses tells Pharaoh, you set the time, tell me, you know, when you want me to pray, you know, for you, your officials, your people, 
Um, and then in verse 10, when Pharaoh says, do it tomorrow, and Moses says, all right, it'll be as you said, then you will know that there is no one like the Lord our God. This is always the goal. Always remember, there is none like the Lord our God. This will increase our faith. This will make us seek him in everything. This will make us pray without ceasing, praise him continually, inquire of him. I don't care what the news says, what people say, what people's opinion says. I don't even care what the preacher says. I don't care what the church says. I don't care what unbelievers say. I don't care what your neighbors say. I don't care what it looks like. You have to know that you know that you know. That there is only one God. There is no one like him. There is no one who can be him. There is no one who can take his place in your life. He commands that there is no other God beside him. And so some other verses of scripture that you want to connect with that is even in Exodus 15. Verses 10 through 12. This is after they're delivered from Egypt. When they go through the Red Sea. When God parts the sea and lets the children of Israel over. And then they go over on dry land across the sea. And then after they're over, God closes up the water and, and destroys the people of Egypt that tried to chase them over there. And so they began to sing praises. The, the Hebrews began to sing praises. And in the midst of it, in verses 10 through 12 in Exodus 15, it says, Thou didst blow with thy wind, the sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. Verse 11, who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? That's a little g, gods. Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Thou stretch out your hand, and the earth swallowed them. Again, it's saying, who is like unto you? Who is like you? Who is like unto you, O Lord, among the gods? Who's like you? Nobody, look what you've done. We've acknowledged your miracle work and power. In 1 Kings chapter 8, write down 1 Kings 8 verses 22 and 23. 1 Kings 8 verses 22 and 23. And it says, And Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven. And he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in heaven above or on earth beneath who keepeth covenant and mercy with thy servants that walk before thee with all thy heart, all their heart. Listen, he's saying there's nobody like you. Nobody merciful like you. Nobody who keeps their promises, their covenants with your servants, those who walk with you, those that honor. There is none like it unto you. We should have trust and faith in people, places, or things. Everything is God's creation, but God is the only God. You look to him and not to people. God can use whomever he wants to do what we need. He can do it in any way that he sees fit. But at the end of the day, you have to know that you know that you know that God is sovereign and in control. And he is the only God. Don't look at people as gods. Oftentimes, people unintentionally are looking at others as their God, looking at money as their God, looking at things as their God, and don't even recognize it until that person fails them, until that thing fails them, until that job releases them, until that thing is not there anymore. And then they find themselves crying out and wondering what has happened. What has happened is, is that person was your God. God. That thing was your God. That place was your God. That job was your God. That business was your God. But when you realize that God is God and you focus on him and you trust in him and you pray to him and you serve him, everything else that you need, it will be taken care of. That's why in Matthew 6, in the last portion of that chapter, Jesus is telling us, don't worry about what you're going to eat, drink, and what you're going to wear. God already knows what you have need of. But he says in verse 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Psalm 89, write down Psalm 89 verses 6 through 9. Psalm 89 verses 6 through 9 and this is what it says. Well, let me get there. For who in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints. And to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong Lord like unto thee? Or to thy faithfulness round about thee? Thou rulest the raging of the sea. When the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. It's saying, who is like you in heaven? Who can be compared to you, Lord? 
Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to you? God is greatly to be feared, to be reverenced, right? Of all them that are about him. And so now he's saying, you know, you rule the raging of the sea when the waves thereof arise. You're the one that steals them. God is in control. Isaiah 45 and 5. We're almost done. Isaiah 45 and 5 says, this is what God says. That's why I want to go to Isaiah. It says in 45 and 5. I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. <laughs> God says, I'm the Lord. There's none other. There's no, no other God besides me. There's none else. Don't look at people, places, and things. Don't look at yourself. There ain't no other God. There, no matter where you look, no matter how great somebody appears to be, no matter how many abilities others seem to have, no matter how many magicians and how many demonic spirits, how many false teachers, how many of this, how many of that, how much money you have, there is no other God. And in uh, chapter 44, verses 6 and 8, we'll just uh, end right there. Isaiah 44, verses 6. And verse, verses 6 and 8, and it says this, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of Lords. I'm sorry. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last, and besides me there is no God. Verse 8, Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told you from that time, and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. <laughs> Period. So our memory verse is going to be uh, Psalm 89, verses 6 through 9. Memory verse says, Psalm 89, verses 6 through 9. And remember, when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, in verse 3, it says, Thou shall have no other gods before me. So remember, there is no other God. He is the one and only true God. There is none other, period. We're going to close out in prayer. Don't forget to hit like, subscribe, and the bell. Share this with somebody if you think they'll benefit from it. Continue to, to do these sit-ups with us so we can get spiritually fit together, so we can work out together, so that we can uh, do spiritual impact training together, so that we are growing, changing, and progressing, being impacted by the word. It's through prayer. It's through the word. It's application. It's walking in it, standing on it. In the name of Jesus. Father, we bless your name. We honor you. We worship you. We glorify you. We thank you, God, that you are the great I am. Help us to remember that you're the one and only true God, that you're our healer, our deliverer, our rock and our fortress, our shelter. You're the source of our peace. You are our provider of every good and perfect gift that comes from you, from the Father of lights. We trust you with all of our heart. We love you with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. Help us to follow you. Help us to surrender to you, submit to you. Listen for your still small voice and obey your commands. God, we love you. We praise you and we honor you. And we know that there is none other. You are the one and only true God. And we give you all the praise, the glory and the honor honor in Jesus name. Amen. God bless you. Love you to life. And I will see you on the next sit up. It's time for sit ups. All sit ups. Spiritual impact training using prayer.